This is the 955 Porsche KN, the original KN, and I'm going to tell you why this car is truly impressive, but also a true Porsche. So watch my video, let me know if you agree. So let's start with a bit of a history lesson. So in the 90s, Porsche had a bit of a cash flow problem. Despite the fact that the excellent Boxer 996 911 was on the horizon, they thought they needed to generate more sales to hence generate more money. And the way they were going to do that was to launch something a bit more mainstream. Now they toyed with a couple of ideas such as the sedan and the off-roader, and obviously it was the off-roader that they went with. Now it's common knowledge that the sister car to this is the Volkswagen Touareg, and you might think that's because Porsche is part of the Volkswagen Empire, which it is today. But it wasn't the case when this car was being developed in the 90s, noughties. And Porsche was looking for a technical partner because obviously making a car like this, which is new to them, is quite a big task and it involves a lot of uh, new development for things like drivetrain, but also interior technology to make this a luxurious model. And they actually approached Daimler first because Mercedes had the ML at the time. Now, that didn't go ahead, I'm not sure why, but I think it's probably a good thing because in my opinion, the ML is not the most sophisticated of cars and how many of them do you still see on the road? Now to Porsche fans, the KN is blasphemy because Porsche make racing cars and sports cars. But you've got to remember that Porsche is an engineering company. Ferdinand Porsche designed the original KDF, which then became Volkswagen and hence the Volkswagen Beetle. So it actually created Volkswagens, which then this car was then co-developed with. Also, Porsche developed the 924, which was supposed to be a Volkswagen, but then actually became a Porsche when VW decided to pull the plug. And that car is actually being celebrated a lot more nowadays. And earlier on, it wasn't considered a proper Porsche, despite some of its clever engineering, like the rear transaxle gearbox. And Porsche have done loads of things, such as developing the seven-seat system for the Vauxhall Opel Sofera. So, you know, the seats that fold into the boot and they developed the engines for the original set Ibiza 2. So Porsche is an engineering company and they are great at doing a wide range of things, not just making sports cars and somehow making rear-engined sports car and supercars work. So to me, this is a proper example of Porsche engineering because this is something quite impressive. This was an off-road vehicle. It does have proper off-road technology and capability that handled really well at a time when cars like this didn't exist. And it really has taken some proper engineering know-how and clever technology selection to make that happen. Now there are some compromises and I will go through what they are later. So I'm gonna address the elephant in the room last and that is the styling, because no doubt you won't agree with my opinion. So stay tuned for that. But before we talk about the rest of the car, let's quickly talk about the lineup. So my car is a Porsche KN S, and in my opinion, a Porsche should have a Porsche engine. It should have its own engine. The 911 has the flat six, and this car does. It has a four and a half liter V8 that Porsche developed for this car and was never used in the Volkswagen Touareg. In fact, the KN was the first front engine Porsche since the 968 and the first V8 engine Porsche since the 928. So it really did sort of continue that legacy. Now at launch there was this car, the four and a half litre naturally aspirated V8 with 340 horsepower which is crazy but there was also the turbo which had 480 horsepower and later on there was the Turbo S which had 520 horsepower. Crazy numbers even today back in 2003 and later on when the Turbo S came out those numbers must have been boggling. Even the S can do 0 to 60 in just over seven seconds, which is impressive today for a two plus ton SUV, let alone back in 2003. So the performance really was a highlight of this car. There was some crossover with engines with the Touareg. So the entry level car eventually did get a 3.2 litre V6 engine, which was shared with the Volkswagen Touareg. It was a Volkswagen engine, the VR6. And there was also a diesel which came along later, a V6 diesel, and obviously that was from Volkswagen again. The Touareg did actually get some of its own engines though, and they were pretty crazy. It got its own V8 petrol, it got the 5 litre V10 diesel, and in some markets it also had the 6 litre W12 engine which went into the Bentley Continental GT. So the two cars very much had different characters and their own engines, apart from 
smaller ones as mentioned. Okay then, so the interior. And it's a bit of a mixed bag in here in terms of design and quality, but I'll explain why that is. But let's start with what's in front of you. So you've got this really big round steering wheel which has buttons on it for the Tiptronic automatic gearbox. Um, so you can override the gear shifts. Uh, my car also has the multifunctional steering wheel, so it has the buttons for the audio system. That was not standard. And one quirky feature it does have is there's buttons on the back of the steering wheel, which allows you to turn the backlighting off for those buttons, but only those buttons. It doesn't turn the backlighting off for anything else. There's actually one on each side, although I do understand if you have the heated steering wheel option, which I don't, then one of the buttons does turn that on and off. Now, a nice Porsche nod is the fact that it's got this sort of five pod dial layout just like the 911 and it actually has six gauges so it has lots of information trying to suggest you know that you need to know lots of things like sports cars typically do. So you've got things like your battery voltage in here and your oil temperature, things that you never normally need to know. Um, but the font and the colours are just like you have on other Porsche models which is very nice. It actually reminds me of my 94 from the 70s so that is definitely something that they've carried across from other Porsches. And another thing is that, subtly, on the fuel gauge, you actually have half marked as two quarters and full as four quarters, which is a Porsche thing for some reason. One thing I will mention about the fuel gauge is that this car has a 100 litre tank, but the fuel gauge comes on at quarter. Uh, the fuel light, sorry, comes on at quarter. So in theory, it should have 25 litres left, but for some reason, it comes on at quarter, so this car always has the fuel light on it. You have a little display in the centre. One thing I do like is that it always shows the speed as a digital reading, so I do use that quite a lot. But that's quite a nice, nice uh, feature there. Now, centre console. So the design in here is quite different to the Touareg, although the overall layout is sort of the same. You have your vents up here. A nice little feature is that the little marking to show you where, whether it's open or closed is illuminated. You've got your infotainment system here. Sat nav was optional, my car has it, uh, as was the phone system, which uses an old style SIM card, not Bluetooth. Back in the days when you could duplicate your SIM card, which you can't do anymore. And then you have your climate control panel down here. For some reason, some of the buttons are hidden behind this little Porsche door. Um, I suppose it's sort of nice, but it seems a bit unnecessary. And then you have these switches here for the temperature and the fan, but they're quite frustrating to use. Although they feel quite nice, it's because every you've got to constantly tap to lower it by half a degree rather than a simple dial so if you've got back in your car the next day and you had it on super cold the day before and you got it in early in the morning you want it on warm then you've spent ages just trying to lift up the temperature so that can be a bit frustrating obviously you've got your automatic gear shifter here to say kn on the surround which is quite a nice touch and then you have some switches here for your off-road uh, hardware so um, similar sort of switch styles are here, which is nice that they've copied it across, but it works better here because you have less things to switch between. So you've got your high and low range and your centre lock and diff, buttons for the uh, air suspension settings, and then also your, your ride height on the air suspension, which my car has. If you don't have air suspension, then this has like a little mini storage tray. Cup holders here, and then you've got a two layer armrest. So the top half is felt lined, and the second half is got a rub has got a rubber mat. Very shallow though in both instances and also the catch is broken and uh, I'll mention a bit more about the build quality as I, as I go through. One nice feature of the KN which is featured on every version of the KN since are these grab bundles here which is quite a nice modern interpretation of the traditional ones you would have on an off-road on the pillars you know, to stop you shaking about. Um, they do feel super solid and they are leather so uh, yeah, very nice, and like I said, they've used that on every KN since. It's become a bit of a KN design queue. Right, in terms of quality then, the, some of the build quality is actually quite iffy. A lot of the catches are broken for things like the armrests, which is annoying. Um, and yeah, lots of things sort of rattle in the car such as, although this is felt lines, things inside the glove box don't rattle, the whole glove box actually rattles. And then things in the door pockets, although there's carpet on the outside, on the inside there's no uh, flocking or anything, so everything inside the door pockets actually rattle. So that's very annoying. 
they try to make up for it in some ways is that the fact that everything's lined in leather which does feel very nice and my car has this two-tone grey I do actually think the tan and the black look better but you know the grey looks quite nice and you've got the satin silver trim a bit like what's on the outside so it does sort of look quite nice but just a lot of the vents in the cars are in the car are broken um, and you know when you compare this to my Renault it seems, it seems like the trim is quite fragile in here. This seemed to have tried to make up a little bit for the quality with quantity. And I'm going to explain because it's actually got five sun visors. So you've got the eventual sun visor here that you can put to the side like you can on most cars. But then you have a replacement. And you also have the same on the other side if I do that. And then there you go, you got one of there. But then you also have one here above the wing mirror which is a sort of a Volkswagen feature. Some, some of the Polos and Golfs had it, sort of blocks out the light above the rear view mirror. Um, and then it also has six 12 volt sockets. So you've got two in the boot, one in the back, one in the ashtray here, and then you've actually got two under the dash. So it just seems to have lots of 12 volt sockets. Now, I'll put these back. Uh, in terms of the rest of the practicality, Mention the armrest, mention the glove box, you've got a sunglass holder up here. Uh, the door pockets are quite small. Um, that's, that's your lot really. There isn't actually a lot of storage in the front at all. Some cars do have a storage tray under the seat, but my car has air suspension, so it has the compressor there, so um, it doesn't, doesn't have that. And actually the 12-watt battery sits under here. The seats themselves are super comfortable, especially on the base, which is really nice and they seem quite hard wearing. But the bolsters are quite hard, so it does a firm, I should say. So it's quite good. So you've got the nice comfort in the base, but you've also got the sort of firm bolsters to sort of keep you in your seat if you're being a bit enthusiastic. Space in the front is, is all right, and the driving position is actually very nice. Um, but that steering wheel does feel very, very large. But then you are driving a large car and you probably need the, the leverage. Right, let's hop in the back and see what that's like. Okay then, so what's the back like? Well, firstly, the seat bases are super squishy, even squishier than they are in the front, which is very comfortable, but I actually find the seating position quite uncomfortable. Now the seat back is actually very upright, it's also very firm, and the floor is actually quite high relative to the seat. So it's almost like being in an electric car, so your thighs don't really rest on the seat. Now there isn't actually a lot of leg room at all, um, you don't really need that much because you do sit quite upright. You can't really spread out like you would like to. You can put your feet under the seat though, so I suppose that's something, but it's just not great. And when you try and put something like a child seat in, there isn't actually that much room to the seat in front to sort of maneuver it in, but also for a child that's going to be kicking the back of your seat all day. So there isn't actually a lot of room in the KN. You really know sit in the back. Now, again, in terms of quality, you know, some nice materials used. The door cards are all leather, so is the center console here. So the materials seem quite nice, but the build quality, again, just seems a bit iffy. So, you know, the vents in the back are broken again. The uh, pockets on the back of the seat are sort of coming away. They're a bit bent, and it's just not brilliant back here. A couple of other not brilliant things there's no one touch on the rear windows even if you operate them from the front they do on the front so clearly they have the capability they've just chosen not to the practicality is dreadful there's a little door pocket here big enough to put your hand in um, you do have an ashtray because this was the early noughties and smoking was the symbol of wealth and there is some cup holders in the center, which you pull out like that, which I suppose is quite handy, but there's not a lot of other storage otherwise, so not brilliant. My car does have blinds, which were an option, and there are some vents here in the pillars as well, so you do get a face vent as well as one by your feet, um, trying to at least make you a bit more comfortable while you're hemmed in the back of this car. Now, a couple of other little things. So this car does have an armrest in the back, which is quite nice. 
uh, it's blocked but the catch is broken on it again another sign of not great build quality it's also quite firm so it's not exactly the nicest thing to put your elbow on but this car does have the true German style a ski sock and it comes out like that and makes it incredibly difficult to put back you can also access it from the boot So there you go, the interior, quite a nice design, some nice materials, but definitely not a lot of storage. And at times or in places, some iffy build quality as well. And oh. So let's talk about the boot. You obviously have a separate opening glass window, which I think is really useful for dropping things in when you haven't got a lot of room. But obviously the boot does open the full weight as well. I'll hop out. So it's a pretty big boot and it's got a lovely sort of carpet to it, nice and thick and a very low, well, flat load lip. You have a parcel shelf, retractable, and also a dog guard, which goes up something like that. So there's a few functional aspects to it. You've got a bit of storage in the side as well with a uh, the auto changer here in the side, very 1990s, and also the same on the other side. Now underneath the floor you have the spare wheel and the compressor for the suspension. Now the spare wheel is actually very interesting because it is collapsible. Basically the wheels are so big on this car, the outer diameter, that they can't get a full-size spare under the floor. And if you wanted a full-size spare, you had to get the carrier that fitted onto the back of the car and made it look like a traditional off-roader. But the collapsible spare tyre essentially is a tyre that folds over itself and hence reduces that overall diameter. And as you inflate it, it sort of unfolds and pops out. It's an incredibly expensive thing to do, an expensive option, but obviously they wanted to offer a spare wheel under the boot floor and it's the only way they could find a way of doing it while packaging all the other things that need to go under here like the rear compressor and some of the body structure there's a couple of 12 volt sockets in here and i'm not going to demonstrate folding the seats because it's a right faff they do actually fold flat but it does take a bit of a while to, to do let's do a quick walk around of some of the technology fitted to the KN. So up front you've got that four and a half litre V8 mounted really far back and as low as it possibly can be. It's all aluminium. And as you can see, it sits very snugly in the engine bay. Actually, there's no space for the 12 volt battery up the front and it's not in the boot where you might expect it. It's actually under the front passenger seat, which makes it a nightmare to access. On the back of the engine, you've got a six speed automatic gearbox which surprisingly wasn't standard. This car actually came with a six speed manual on the V8S and on the V6, but it's very hard to find a manual. Autos were by far the most common. On the back of the gearbox, you've got a two speed transfer case. So this car has low range and it also has a center locking differential. Now my car has optional air suspension, so you can set it to various ride heights as standard. It came with steel coil springs. I've mentioned the aluminium engine. There is lots of aluminium used around this car, such as for the double wishbone suspension. And you can see here, I have six piston brake calipers, which is serious braking technology to have on a mainstream car like this. It's obviously to try and give great braking performance for a car this heavy, and that might be driven as quickly as this. Now you can actually tell which version of the KN it is based on the color of the calipers. So my car is an S, so the calipers are silver. The base V6 KN came with black calipers and the turbo came with red. So if you want a quick way to see which version of the KN it is, look at the color of the calipers. Now underneath, you've actually got a stainless steel exhaust system running underneath. Very expensive, obviously quite lightweight, but it's very rare to find on a uh, mass market car like this, an SUV. So they've obviously spent a lot of money. Now on the back, you've got four piston calipers. And as you can see, my car has 20 inch alloys, which is the largest size that you could get on the KN. It started with 17 inch going up. And this has low profile tires, which I'll talk about the effect of that later when it's on the road. Now you can see that these are 275 wide. And yes, I do need to replace the brake discs. That is on my list to do. 
Now, round the back, you can see the stainless steel exhaust system there, and the KNS came with single separate outlets, but the turbo came with a quad sort of setup. You can see a cutout on the bumper there, that's for a tow bar, which my car has fitted, but I don't have the hook on right now. So before we set off, one thing I forgot to mention is that when I did the interior review, you may have noticed that there's no hand-operated handbrake on the centre console. And that's because this car has an American style foot operated part brake, which you put on with the lever here and you release with the hand lever here. Now it frees up the center console, which is pretty nice. And it is very easy to smash the part brake on with your foot a lot easier than trying to pull a lever towards you. But I do think it just feels a bit naff. And then around when the KN came out, cars were introducing electronic part brakes. So in a way it's a shame it hasn't got that, but, uh, yeah, you get used to it quite quickly, although when I first got it, I was driving away with the handbrake on. What does that technology mean for the way the KN drives? Well, I have already done videos taking this car to an off-road course and on track, testing the car to the two extremes that it was designed for. But I'm going to talk about what it's like to drive on the road, and let's start with that four and a half litre V8. Well, it's definitely well suited to this car, despite this car being as heavy as it is. 340 horsepower is definitely enough. And it definitely moves very quickly. I can definitely believe the performance figures they quote. It also sounds fantastic. It's quite muted, but it has a wonderful tone, especially in the higher revs. And it's a good balance of sounding quite performance orientated while being quite refined and luxurious sounding still. speed automatic and the shifts up and down despite the car being 19 years old are super smooth up shifts are very good what I would just say is that it's quite reluctant to shift down it does like to try and be as close to a thousand rpm as it can all of the time so I don't know if it does it in the name of efficiency although this car day to day is getting about 15 miles per gallon I very rarely have managed to get it over 20 indicated or it might just be because the gearbox needs a full service. It does always start in second gear. Uh, first gear is very short. I assume that's because it's designed for launch and for off-road capability, although it does also have a low range, but you can change gear with the buttons on the steering wheel, the Tiptronic feature that the autos came with. Although you can change up and down on both sides of the steering wheel, it's not rather than one side being up and one side being down. But it is very responsive if you use them, so you can override that sluggishness to, to change down. Before I talk around about the handling, I'm going to talk about the ride because I'm on a piece of road which demonstrates what I'm trying to say very well. So it has three modes. It has wallowy, uncomfortable and bone shaking, although Porsche call them comfort, normal and sport. And that's for the air suspension. Now, I'm on a road that looks relatively smooth to me, but when you're in comfort mode, you bounce around all over the place. It really does back off the damping and it does actually make me feel quite car sick, although I never get car sick. The other extreme is sport, which maximizes the damping. And what actually then happens is you get shaken to bits. The ride quality is genuinely poor. And even in normal, although it's a balance between the two, it's still crashy and uncomfortable. And it's probably not helped by the fact that this is on those low profile 20 inch wheels, but the ride is definitely a massive compromise to try and deliver the capability of this car. I'm not driven a um, standard steel suspension setup with coil springs. I don't know how that fares, but the ride quality is pretty poor. Sure, but that is the compromise they've come to to deliver fantastic body control. This car, no matter what mode you're in, doesn't roll around, it doesn't pitch, it doesn't dive. It has so much mechanical grip from those Y275 tires. It also has a uh, constant split in terms of torque front to rear axle, so you can't adjust that, but it's really, really capable. As you can probably see when I did my track video, you can really drive this car much quicker than you think you should be able to. And despite sitting quite high up, it's just not rolling around like you would think it, it should be. very, very impressive. 
the steering through this massive steering wheel is quite numb. You don't get a lot of feedback. Most of the feedback is through your ass. All the, uh, the, the, the bumps it manages to invent in the road. But because it has so much grip and so much body control, you don't actually need that much feel through the steering wheel. It manages to be very confident inspiring and you can throw it around despite having that feedback through the steering wheel. The steering is quite nicely weighted. There's not too much corruption from all the bumps and it's quite easy to manoeuvre when you're trying to park. So it is quite a good balance, but yeah, it is, it is a bit numb. It's not, it's not a sports car but they have done incredibly well with what they've got. Refinement is very good. Wind noise and, and tire noise is very low. Most of the noise you get from this car is very much from the interior creaking and rattling from all the bumps transmitted into the cabin and also things rattling in the door pockets because they're not lined like they are on Volkswagens in terms of rubber matting or with felt. So that's definitely a bit of a dropping quality, I think. Now you sit high up, as you would expect. Um, driving position is actually very good. Big steering wheel, like I said. The pedals are very well positioned. You have a really fat brake pedal, so you can also left foot brake if you choose to. Great for driving on, on the track, or a bit more spiritedly. And you have a fantastic view over the bonnet. The dash is quite low. The bonnet's quite low. It sort of falls away from you, very different to something like a Land Rover Discovery. But you do have those classic Porsche bulges just above the headlights. And that really helps with sort of positioning the car because you can see where the corners are on the side of the car is. And visibility generally is pretty good. Although the very dark tinted aftermarket windows does make it quite difficult to see out of at night. But overall, it's just so impressive the way this thing drives. It really is. It's so capable. It's very enjoyable to drive quickly. And yeah, the performance from that engine is just brilliant. It's very well suited to the character of this car. And, and this is the base naturally aspirated V8. God knows what the turbo and the turbo S feel like. The performance must be absolutely crazy. Okay then, let's address the styling of the KN. I think the KN looks great. Cue the comments. I think it has a really nice, simple shape and a great stance delivered by these wonderful proportions where it's quite wide, but it's not so long. And it has quite a long front end, obviously, to house those massive engines that it came with. They've obviously tried to graph the design of the 996-911 on the front end of an SUV, but I think it actually works. I really like the fried egg headlight design, even on the 911, and they've obviously tried to go for this lower center bonnet that you have on the 911, which was obviously possible by the fact that it was rear-engined, so it's not as exaggerated on the KN, but you still have these lovely haunches above the headlights, as I mentioned, you can see that you're inside the car. Also, you have a myriad of vents around the front and quite an aggressive approach angle, which isn't so obvious because it's hidden in black plastic. I do think the KN looks much better in darker colours, like my dark teal, which is quite a rare colour, or the dark blues and the blacks. The lighter colours, like the silvers and golds, uh, just, just don't suit the car as well and don't highlight some of its features. Now, I do think perhaps the KN Turbo deserves the sort of reputation for being ugly a bit more than this car because it does have more vents that sort of come up higher which makes it look a bit gawky and it has Xenon headlights as standard which makes it look a bit cross-eyed uh, whereas my car has halogen headlights which is amazing that a car this expensive has had halogen headlights rather than Xenon which was popular at the time for luxury vehicles. But I do think it really does look really great. And, in, and on these 20 inch wheels, they obviously suit the car as well. They don't look too lost in the arches, whereas some of the smaller alloy wheel designs do. Around the side, it's where it's most obviously linked to the Touareg because the doors are quite similar. But I do really like how you've got this sort of satin metal trim around the windows and on the boot lid. 
it looks a bit more expensive and modern than just the traditional sort of reflective chrome and you can get it in black but I do think it looks really good in silver it makes this car look quite fancy. Now around the back you can really see where that lovely sort of simple well proportioned design is because it's got these lovely haunches over the rear wheels it's a very simple hatchback shape and it's got single tail light clusters rather than having lights everywhere and a bumper and all sorts like on the Audi Q7. It's got an integrated colour coded spoiler which makes it a little, a little bit sporty and it's got that sort of satin trim at the lower end of the glass. So I do think it looks really nice and again you've got a very aggressive departure angle at the back that's hidden in unpainted trim. Now you could get off-road packs for this car which makes it look more traditionally like an off-road vehicle with the black trim around the, the wheel arches. I think it looks really good without them but you could get those off-road packs and it also added uh, the option of a spare wheel hung off the back of the car like a defender but it does have its own sort of arms and it looks a bit rubbish and after 40. Now I think when they facelifted this car and made it the 957, they sort of ruined it. They tried to address some of the concerns and criticisms about the design, but they just more, made it more fussy and sort of overly aggressive, especially at the front and at the back you had extra creases and notches out the rear lights and it just looked a bit too fussy and overdone in my opinion. I think the original car looks really fantastic, it's just got such a pure and simple shape and design. The design's all in the sort of proportions really and the surfacing and I think it looks really good for it and there's definitely a good distinction between this and the Touareg and uh, I really don't think it deserves its reputation for design that, that it got really. Maybe it's because nowadays it's not as shocking because every manufacturer has an SUV, the DVX, the uh, Eurus where they try to translate you know a supercar design theme onto a, an SUV shape and this was one of the first to do it. And it wasn't such a traditional off-road looking car like you know, the cars that are out at the time. So maybe it was just controversial and it was just a bit shocking. Whereas now, as we've mellowed, we can come back and reflect more on how good this design really was when it came out and, and how we should look back on it quite positively. Okay, so my verdict on the KN. Well, I think this is a truly impressive car. When you think about what the brief was for this car, it was insane. It was to deliver an SUV which could do all the boring stuff like accommodate passengers and have a big boot and have all the technology that most people ex uh, expect to have while being quite luxurious and comfortable, yet being very capable off-road and very capable on-road. Those two extremes hadn't been mixed together really other cars before and largely the KN delivers it it is truly impressive off-road it has a lot of the technology yet it doesn't seem to hinder the way it drives on road and obviously there are some compromises like the ride quality and the fact that it's got a lot of expensive componentry on it and it probably does add up and contribute to the weight of this car and the interior is also very compromised in terms of its packaging it has a big boot, it has a big engine bay, but in the middle there's not a lot of space for actual people. But I really do think we should reflect back on this car really positively and the splash that it made and obviously set uh, a precedent really for what this type of car should be and you know, spearheaded a lot of rivals. This to me is a proper Porsche. It has the Porsche ingenuity, it has a Porsche engine, it had that sort of Porsche determination to deliver something new and capable and I do think the later KNs lose a lot of that because they do share more with uh, the Audis and the Volkswagens and, and the other premium uh, offshoots and that sort of compromised the core vehicle architecture and made it more compromised in terms of having that ideal setup for weight distribution by having the engine much further forward and there's obviously a lot more commonality so there isn't as much distinction in the characters. I'm sure the later KNs are more capable on-road and probably just as capable off-road by having some clever four-wheel drive systems but I just think it just loses the magic of this car and the fact that it does feel like a proper Porsche. Now the styling everyone's going to have their views on but I do think it is a car that we should reflect on really positively and it's starting to get under the radar of Porsche Classic and there's still quite a lot of them around because they are 
very well built and they don't really rust like a lot of Land Rovers and Range Rovers do. Um, so, you know, we'll probably see them around for a while and they may eventually become a classic Porsche up there with the 928 and the 924, which were underappreciated when they came out, but have later gained the recognition they deserve. And I'm not sure you can really say the same about the later KNs or even the Macan because it just doesn't have the, the effort that went into this car. And this is very much not a VW Touareg with some glitzy bits on it. This is very much a Porsche and the Volkswagen was just there to, to make this thing possible. And I think uh, we shouldn't take anything away from it for that. So as ever, let me know your thoughts on the styling but also whether you agree with that it is a proper Porsche um, and whether it deserves to be a future classic going forward and uh, yeah thanks for watching